is up, Fight fans, and welcome to episode two of Sports Not Scrap Report. I am, of course, Jason Burgos, and I am joined by my brother from a different East Coast mother. And as you can tell, we dress alike because we're that close. And it's Anthony Walker, Senor Beeman. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Jason. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, despite my deep-seated hatred for you. And um, I'm ready to talk about fights. I mean, it's it's a lot of interesting topics to to get to today. And yeah, no better person to talk about with it than you, my man. I mean, it, it, there really is no better person on the planet. And I, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I mean, you know, when you're that good, you're that good. And and, and, and to showcase that the goodness, let's just jump right into the conversation because, folks, we've got a lot of different things, a lot of different topics to cover from the world around make some interesting ones. The first one we want to get to, if you weren't paying attention and you're just living in only the UFC bubble, hopefully you're not MMA fans. And that was an interesting thing that happened at the PFL's event last week, the, one of their final events leading into the playoffs, which begin in August. August, and that was that House Manfio and Natan Schultz, two former champions of the tournaments in previous years, they were facing off in the lightweight division to set up either one, a win would get them into the playoffs. Now, the interesting thing here is that both of them are close friends, uh, supposedly lived together at one time, the training partners, they're tight. And while some friends you know, have no problem fighting, these guys had a serious problem fighting each other. And if you've watched the fight, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I recommend it because it is pretty much a glorified sparring contest. These guys are throwing like 60% punches, punching power, going forward, just takedowns and doing no kinds of, of, of punching or strikes on the mat. And it's a weird situation. Clearly, they didn't want to hurt each other. But the the thing you have to factor in is, yeah, they, it, they weren't both going to get into the playoffs. So someone was going to lose here. So there is some impetus and some reason for them to want to win this fight. Yet both of them just didn't want to hurt each other, which in a way I kind of respect that they didn't want to hurt their friend. And the Tom Schultz who won the fight was even crying after costing his friend a chance to go to the, the, play, the playoffs. Now, from that fact is PFL didn't like that. And they got backlash for the fight, understandably. And because of that, they suspended both guys. Natan Schultz was taken out of the playoffs. Instead, UFC import Shane Burgos, who won later tonight. A win got him, would have kept him out of the playoffs because Natan would have had just more points than him. The UFC guys, former UFC guys, instead. And we have a really inter interesting situation. Now, I have different points on of you, but since I, I set it all up, I want to get your thoughts on this, this very uncommon situation. We've seen one championship adjust things after the fact and weird situations but this is unique in that they're just taking a guy out of the playoffs despite winning his first fight fair and square and putting someone else in that technically didn't deserve it i i really don't know where to start with this because there are so many different angles to attack this this subject matter on the first i i'm gonna have to point the finger at pfl not for their action after the fight but their actions before the fight what a stupid match to make. You know, they they do have some control over the matchmaking in, you know, before it gets to the playoffs. Like, why would you pit two best friends against one another? You know, we've seen we, we've seen cases where it, it kind of goes the other direction and guys just go out and slug at each other. But more often than not, you, you, if two people genuinely care about one another, they, they might not try to concuss and bludgeon each other as, as hard as they I would will, someone that they're not connected to. Let me just add one quick thing, and that's a great point you make about why would they they match them up. But in the end, this is a May, and May's fight game. On paper, that should be something you'd want to sell, two friends fighting. And I will add, I think it was in 20 season two, um, Ray Cooper fought his cousin <laughs> in a fight, and they went at it. So I get what you're saying, but I mean, on a on a booking level, two friends fighting should make sense, you know. But it just they they game the system. The, I mean, but maybe they did game the system. I think that's that's something that needs to be investigated. Like that needs to be that needs to be figured out for um, you know keeping things above board. Both PFL and the the two combatants, they need the someone outside of the uh, organization needs to look into what exactly the intentions were when that opening bell rung, because it's it's just as plausible that they talk to one another backstage or in in their shared training camps and said and said, hey, um, like uh, let's not beat the crap out of each other. It's also possible that they got in that cage, looked at one another, and saw 
their friendship and saw, you know, the fact that their families are close and whatnot and just couldn't do it. Um, so we talked about, I, well, we didn't, we didn't talk about this on, on this show. We, we definitely have talked about like what Ilya Tapura did to Josh Emmett um, last Saturday. Right. And it was, I, I made a comment on Twitter about the pace that Tapuria kept in that fight. And it was, he fought at a sparring pace. Like he didn't really exert himself too much until he wanted to go for the finish. Right. But this was, the, this was the sparring pace, but flipped in the just very, very action low, very, very difficult to watch thing. They, they, they just pity padded at each other. And the only real effort that you saw exerted was when Schultz tried to go in for it a couple takedowns, which he didn't really try that hard. Um, you know, um, Manfield didn't exactly try to defend them with his er most earnest efforts. It was, it, it was, it was very much a, a friendly sort of just technical uh, sparring session. Um, I, I, I can't get past the point where I want to blame PFL for putting this match together. I, I can't get past that because you don't put yourself in this situation. You don't do it. They got lucky with the Cooper cousins. <laughs> they got lucky yeah. in that. <laughs> like if, if you put, if you put me and you uh, against each other, fight, we're, we're very good friends off camera and whatever. We're, we're very good friends. I probably would have a problem punching you in the face as hard as I could. You probably would try to punch me. You, you would, not be successful okay yeah i probably wouldn't but i'd think about it <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 creating a, a situation that doesn't need to exist yeah. and and the the handling of this has sort of unraveled a lot of the legitimacy that we look toward for pfl like to have this this dedicated turn tournament structure where the biggest stars don't necessarily advance the the yeah. the hot prospect and the hot name doesn't necessarily make it to the finals you know, when you, you got Anthony Pettis on the roster and he doesn't make it into the postseason, you know, OK, you're, you're pretty much dedicated to the path of legitimacy. This undermines that. But at the same time, does it undermine it if the two guys fighting didn't actually fight one another? Is this PFL correcting? Um, they're they're self-correcting something that one, a situation they started and two, that was made worse by the two guys who didn't actually fight. And I think so this, this, I'm a, all over the place with this man. And I, I I'm, I'm with you. And it's, it's got to fall on the PFL. And, and to me, I think they, in the end have to just eat it and let it happen because I'm, I, I, I I'm cool with Shane Burgos and I'm happy for him getting in the playoffs again and an opportunity to make that million. But in the end, the Tom Schultz still won his fight. Mafia won his fight. Like you said, like they didn't have to book this fight. There's multiple opponents that they could have matched up. They probably went with trying to go with this angle friends fighting, but you know them. This is this very small roster. I'm sure they have an inkling that this is probably going to be problematic. And in the end, what kind of Pandora's box are you opening up? Are you going to start fixing other things? There's going to be situations where other things happen. That's not cool. Are, are, are those just going to be a no contest or are you going to say, no, you know, he probably should have won. He, you're going to give people wins. I think it, it opens up things because in, in other sports, we see it. There's not players getting suspended or fined for maintenance days in NBA. They're within the guidelines, the NBA and those teams kind of, they, they gaming the system. Yeah. It's co costing fans money that they wanted to go see these stars, but they're not doing anything about that really. And that's what, happening in other sports. What they've tried. You know, the NBA has, has actively tried. They just have players unions and, yeah. and whatnot that prevent them from actually succeeding on those efforts. So, I mean, this is opening up a much broader conversation right here because yeah. you're, you're bringing up an excellent point. Like the, the fighters should have some level of uh, autonomy here about what they do and the promotion needs to be above board and these conflicting interests have met you know, in a very, very lackluster fashion last week. Yeah. I mean, I just think like I get what they're doing and I, and I can see the pop, like how it's well received, but it, I just think you, it is what it is. It happens. 
Um, and like I mentioned, like, it's not like if they were both going to get into the playoffs, but like, you know, either way or something like that, then, then I could see the frustration, but a loss was going to cost one of these guys a million dollars. And they, in the end chose friendship over, you know, like really going at that chance to make the money. And that's in a way, I think that's pretty admirable. And it just is what it is. You know, Shane Burgos, he, he would have not made it, but I mean, I think it's, it's a weird situation. They're opening up. I can see both points of views and everything. And, and, and again, again, it, it's one of those weird things that only seem to happen outside the UFC. <laughs> yeah. As much as the negative things the UFC does, they don't seem to make these mistakes. And that's why they're the UFC. And that's why everybody else is not the UFC. But I mean, well, let's move on. They don't, the, they, they, they don't make these mistakes in front of us. That's, that's, that's the difference. That's, that's the difference. That's true. Now, before we move on to the next subject, I, I just want to kill the narrative that this is all to favor Shane Burgos getting in to the, to mm -hmm. the playoffs. Shane Burgos yeah. is without a doubt, one of the most talented people on the roster. He's put together numerous exciting fights throughout his career. And we would love to see him in the playoffs just for the pure entertainment value. So let's, let's yeah. throw that out there. But this guy is as, as exciting as he is, as talented of a fighter as he is, this guy's not driving a, a whole bunch of new fans. So this is not some effort to fix things so that Shane Burgos gets to the playoffs. This was a crappy situation that started by, you know, foolishness or carelessness or uh, heavy sentiment or wh wherever you want to begin the, the, the origins of this thing at, but it, it wasn't a conspiracy to get Shane Burgos into the playoffs. It's not yeah. Shane Burgos is not a star beyond the this very very small bubble of hardcore mma fans and plus if you look at the standing it wasn't like there was someone else he was tied with and then he chose him over this person it was either the tom schultz or him he was next in the line and, and they did it technically the right way it just worked out for them even better it was shane burgos that had that position but moving on from there i just want to talk quickly about this because it was a story as, as silly as it is it's a story and it's being a, continues to be a story because Dana White continues to push it. This is the, if you haven't seen it, you can go on, 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 on ringside seat and tell we, we, we covered it over there, but, um, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, this idea of they might fight each other. They had a lit interesting back and forth on social media and opened up the possibility of, 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 a, of a possible fight between them. Um, and, 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 you know, it's a, it's a, it's only being pushed more and more and becoming more and more of a bigger deal because Dana White is very much interested in making this fight happen. Anthony, are you okay over there? I can't see you on video anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I You slowed up for a second, too. So okay. this is I can't uh, Riverside. see your video at all right now. <laughs> oh, really? I'm looking <laughs> no, at myself and I'm ha as handsome as ever. Okay, hopefully you see yourself. Hopefully it's, it's all recording correctly. But I mean, and but Dana White really wants to do this fight. He he's talking about that this fight could be the biggest in the history of the world because of who these two people are. And it, he actually threw out the number. It could do triple of what Mayweather and McGregor did in 2017, which is four million buys, one of the biggest of all time. I mean. Like, is this like elite level greed? Like, 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 do we really need to see? Let let them go do it somewhere else. But no, of course, Dana wants to do it and he wants to promote this. Like this idea that everyone wants to see. It, I don't know. Is there really a ton of people that are just huge Elon Musk fans? I know they have followers and everything like that. But are there a two huge ton of ton of people that love Mark Zuckerberg? I think it will do well. I don't think it's gonna do triple of what McGregor Mayweather could it do three million? Sure. But then again, he suggested in in when talking about it, that he's gonna charge a hundred dollars. People just don't want to pay. It's already tough enough for UFC to sell regular pay per views for like eighty. Nobody's going to want to see that these guys for hundred dollars. It's not elite fighters. Is this just elite level gr greed? And it's just just a stupid, ridiculous topic that this is even something that's being pushed by the head of the top MMA promotion, the top fight game promotion in the world. Uh, it, this is all things stupid rolled into a very <laughs> weird piece of sausage. Like this, this is. <laughs> absolutely the dumbest thing in the world but the the worst part about it is that dana's right about the numbers that this would do you know th yeah. the hundred dollar price tag okay that's that's where things start getting a little murky but this would by far be the most successful fight from a box office standpoint okay. as you can imagine because this attracts thing this attracts the the eyeballs of people who aren't into fights this is going to attract the tech weirdos. This is going to attract the fight yeah. fans that are already used to this sort of carnival. Um, this is going to attract 
a, a, a host of bozos, right? This is going to attract all sorts of people from all over the place to watch two people who have no business actually in a in a um, sanctioned professional or televised mixed martial arts event against one another because their celebrity goes beyond the the limited idea that we have celebrity in the fight game. Like, as far as people that are influential, powerful, known, um, let's let's keep let's let's like tier everything here, right? So you got like you got like um, Shane Burgos. We got Shane Burgos, right? Great fighter. Um, then you've got an Israel Adesanya. You've got a Chuck Liddell, who's like more in the mainstream, uh, getting close to that mainstream star. Then you've got a Conor McGregor. Then you've got a Floyd Mayweather. And then somewhere up here, you've got Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, as, as far as just influence and power and the amount of eyeballs they can attract. These two people are in control of the biggest social media apps in the world. They have this tremendous hold on information. This promotes itself. Like they, the, the promotional tools are built in already. And I'm actually confused as to why the UFC is needed for this. Why, true. why does That's Elon true. Musk or Mark Zuckerberg need Dana White for a damn thing right now? <laughs> there is yeah. there is literally nothing yeah. that he can provide to this thing that they can't provide for themselves in any standpoint. They certainly got the money to pull this off, right? Yeah. They have they the access the to the people. Yeah, they got the yeah. platforms. They got the access to the people that they need. They have every single thing that they need to make this happen, except for the skills to actually fight. <laughs> and that's secondariness. So I'm I'm if if I'm Dana White, yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on this too. Because this is about the easiest payday he'll ever see. This is the easiest payday since uh, Mayweather McGregor um, for doing like absolutely no work and everything just kind of falling into your lap. That's exactly what this would be. So, um, yeah, I, this is one of those things where like like promotion, fight promotion starts feeling really disgusting, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're genuine fans. We're... I guess analysts or experts or whatever you want to call us. Like we're people who are, who are definitely tuned in to combat sports and watch it with a particularly critical eye and, you know, get a paycheck for, for breaking things down beyond just the basic level. So to us, this is, this is eating dog food when there's a ribeye that's on the grill. Um, But a lot of people will eat dog food. So here we are puppy chow, baby. Fair. Fair enough. Per perfect way to end Puppy that. Chow also, FC. If you like what we're talking about here, please like the show, share, subscribe to the channel. Uh, and also let us know what you think. Let us know what do you think on these topics, Zuckerberg and Musk, and what's, what happened with the PFL. Moving on from that, uh, there was a recent story about Anderson Silva. He is in talks to possibly have a fight in Japan. Wasn't clear if it's an MMA fight necessarily, or it could, it could be boxing. But I would imagine if it's going to be in Japan, there's probably a good chance some uh, theory theorizing maybe it's a retirement fight in japan where kind of his really his career f uh, bloomed and really got he was put on the kind of the, the map in terms of the industry and stuff like that internationally but let's say it, it is a, a retirement fight um and i was thinking about that i came up with a small list of, of possible opponents because that's what it is who was he facing in the last fight fedor got to face bader for the bellator heavyweight title in the last fight it's a big deal and stuff like that who could be available so i came up with a list i threw some bellator names I threw in, in some other free agent kind of names, threw in, in, in a one one championship name. Maybe they'll be willing to co-promote. If it's, say, if it's Risen, Bellator guys are probably very likely and stuff like that. But of, I threw in Douglas Lima. That would be interesting if it's like I'm at a middleweight now that he's moved up to middleweight, if Anderson's willing to come down to that. And again, Charlie Ward, He's if you just want an exciting fight guy that's going to come forward, a middleweight, he, he, that would be interesting. If you just want a fun fight for Anderson's fight. Yo Romero, if Anderson doesn't want to cut weight, they could both fight at 205. That would be a sellable fight while also being a great send-off, maybe for both. Um, I threw Yoshihiro Akiyama, Sexyama. It's it's it's, it's going to be in Japan. Easy fight for them to sell. Would make a lot of sense. That it, it may be not relevancy now, but they're both sort of names. Uh, I threw out there Ang La and Song for one championship. He's another good, going to come forward, striker, exciting fighter, if, if for a light heavyweight and uh, middleweight, stuff like that. 
Thiago Santos, PFL fighter, maybe he he's not back for next season. Because in the end, Anderson's gonna is supposed to do two movies, and then he's gonna do this fight. So it's gonna be down the line. It's probably 2024, most likely kind of thing. Vitor Belfort rematch, maybe you do that, and then I suggest a Michael Bisping rematch because he is. I don't. I don't think his UFC commentator work affects who he does fighting out outside the company. But among those, Lima, Ward, Romero, Akiyama, Ansong, Santos, Belfort, Bisping, any of those interest you, or, or do you think there's a, a better option if this is a possible MMA retirement fight for him in Japan? Well, I will throw out the same name that I've been throwing out for several years, which I know is not going to happen. I asked Scott Coker myself about this. Um, I wanted to see Anderson Silver versus Fedor. That's the fight that I really wanted to see. Fedor, yeah. if he's if this retirement is going to stick, then that's gone. Um, but quite frankly, I don't think this fight actually does happen. Okay. With all of that time in between, um, Anderson Silva turned down the the chance to fight Fedor in his retirement fight because he didn't want to do like MMA training because he said it was just too tough on his body. Mm. That, so that's why he stuck with boxing. So I don't think, you know, um, working two movies and just getting older during that time, it's going to change that at all. <laughs> I don't think it's going to make his body any more, um, any more well conditioned for mixed martial arts training. But if I'm going to pick these, like of the names you listed here, I'll probably go Yoel Romero. It's it's a fight that feels like it should have happened already. Yeah. Um, it's a fight with another guy who's got a pretty good fan base and and has built a nice legacy for himself. And it's something we haven't seen before. Okay, um, they they could do it at two o five. Yo Romero can provide sort of the perfect canvas for Anderson Silva to do what he does. Like that style wise, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. Granted, it could turn into Romero and Adesanya all over again, but considering Silva is much diminished athletically, um, then probably not. It's probably going to be some <laughs> level of exciting and weird and sad at the same time. So I, I guess that's it. Uh, Vito Belfort would be an okay option, but I, I don't really need to see that again. Michael Bisping has one eye. He, he should never, <laughs> never fight again. Um, yeah. he should stay in the commentary booth where I think he does a, fa a fine job. Just, just yeah. stay there and stay safe and protect that other eye. <laughs> Tiago Santos. I, it just seemed, it seems like too much of a mismatch. I think Santos is too <laughs> close to being a viable, you know, high level fighter yeah. for Anderson Silva to be fighting. Akiyama doesn't really do much for me, but I, I guess you throw that in Japan. It makes some sense. Ang Song, no, too close to being a, a relevant Man. fighter. Charlie Ward, just not a big enough name, just like doesn't deserve that level of platform. Uh, no disrespect. Mm. Douglas Lima, once again, too close to being something legitimate. And yeah, I, and, and then if, if, if Silva doesn't want to cut weight and he wants to fight at 205, Douglas Lima is, is going to look like he's going to look terrible at 205. Like he's going to be gut rolling over and stuff. We don't need that. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't so, have so I to guess come in at that weight. He could be like 197 or whatever. And stuff like that. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. But <laughs> it, but this is not going to happen. It's just yeah. not going to happen. Anderson Silva is going to film a couple of movies, and then he's going to sit on his couch and he say, you know what? This is really comfortable here. I'm not getting up. And let's That's, look. I mean, what, what, let's see his, his age. Because Anderson is what? Was he like, like 48 46? or something like that? Yeah, 48 years old. And he turned 40 in April. Let's say this is it, it early next year. He's going to be, he may be almost there or at 49, 40. And man, yeah. Yeah. Well, like you said, most of those guys that are anywhere near relevancy is pushing it too hard. So, yeah. I, I mean, Romero is uh, the closest in age and he slowed down so much at 205. He's even slower. So, it, it really is the best one for me. I mean, but going on from that, and let's continue kind of on an Anderson Silva kind of tilt is that um, if you, if anybody forgot, when he fought Jake Paul last year, there was this un this unofficial bet that yeah you know, if Jake beat him that Anderson would help him in a union and I, I, that's part of why Jake Paul appears appeals to me I'm not talking about I don't I'm not his fight skills are cool I, mean, I respect that he's what he's done he's a phenomenal athlete like his brother Logan but him being a disruptor for the industry pushing the idea of fighter pay and all those kind of things unionizing it, it, I, I I appreciate that and wanting to work with Anderson Silver for such a thing 
is great. And supposedly in a recent interview for MMA Mania, he mentioned that they, it's still something they've been talking about behind the scenes working on, but he did make this quote by saying, it's just damn near impossible to figure out, figure this one out. It's very difficult, very, very difficult. For us, we've been covering this sport for a long time. They're not the first to try this. They're, Anderson is not the first big name star to try this. I think that that uh, antitrust lawsuit is still going on with the UFC that included guys like John Fitch and and, and people in it. Um, it, it just it just feels like it's never going to happen. And I think boxing, the fact that it's never happened in boxing, is a perfect example because that it should have, if it could have, a long time ago in boxing. And with the dominance of the ufc and their ability to take the oxygen out of the the industry take it such a huge part of it and then can kind of control fighters and manipulate them and, and in the end everyone wants to go there it's, it's it's kind of like it's been propagandized in a way that that's the only place you can go and that's the place you want to go and even though it's all about making money and there's other opportunities i mean is this he says it, it could still be something that maybe takes a few more years to do. We've heard that before. Is this, considering how much he pushed for this, and if he loses again, his, his name value is going to further decline and it'll, it'll, the idea will fade away. Is, is this maybe the death knell on the U unions and MMA idea? Um, I don't think the, the death knell on the unions and MMA um, idea has anything to do with Jake Paul. I think that's just um, an inherent problem that's going to be in the sport because fighting is such an individualistic pursuit. And in order to be in it, you have to believe that you're the absolute best in the world. And they look at the top level fighters and the money that they're making and they see, oh, that's me. And anything that includes we means I don't have the chance to reach that goal um, in the same fashion. So that's something that's just going to be a problem. Jake Paul had nothing to do with this. I think the Jake Paul Anderson Silver fighter union that was discussed was dead before the words even left Jake Paul's mouth because mm -hmm. I don't think he was serious. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was just a promotional tactic. That was something to piss off Dana. That was something to get guys like us to talk about this upcoming fight, their, their, their then upcoming fight. And it was just a narrative to add to the storyline. That, that's all it was. Um, now, I do believe that that he has at least had a conversation or two with Silva or his people in regards to this. But do, do you really think Jake Paul is going to stop making all this money that the people are literally just handing him over to him for him to go in and just, and just beat the crap out of um, athletes of yesteryear? Notice I didn't say fighters. At, athletes of yesteryear. In, in a couple cases, you think he's going to stop that to then, and, and keep in mind, he's a promoter too. He's someone who benefits from fight promotion being set up the way it is. He directly benefits from the UFC and mixed martial arts being set up the way it is. Like he's going to dismantle that. Like this guy, he's going to stop making all his money to dismantle that. I, I don't buy it. I like the talk that he generates around it. I like the the eyeballs he brings to the subject, but I'm never going to rest my hopes on Jake Paul um, bringing Anderson Silva on board to save mixed martial arts. Quite honestly, I think if he's sincere, their best efforts will be put toward the uh, the push for the Ali Act to expand the mixed martial arts. That seems like a much better use of their time. That seems like something they actually could have some level of influence in as opposed to creating this fighter union from scratch. I think you're right, and I've, I've mentioned that in, in places before. The Ali Act, that's, that's really the way to go if there's any chance. Honestly, I, I will, I'm going to have to disagree. I think he does want this to happen just because... There's money in this. There's money in a in a union. There's money. There's people. There's jobs. There's part of getting a percentage of of this massive UFC and MMA pie. And I don't think he gets enough credit. He's a far better businessman than he's an athlete, and he's a pretty good athlete. Him and his brother have been very good businessmen. They built a brand from nothing out of Ohio to become YouTube sensations. They did acting. They did rapping. They're doing this. They, they got this platform and they expand. This guy got a promotion. He's got a man of Serrano. He's, you know, he, he, both of them, his brother Logan's got prime and they're, they're doing things. He's doing WWE. Like they are very smart. And it seems like they're trying to get their hands in as many pots because in the end, everything won't last and try to make as much money as you can. And I think he's definitely open to the idea of a union because there's money to it because this boxing thing is just not going to last anymore and, and forever. And, 
he's shown he's willing to be a multitasker and do multiple things. And and I don't think he'll at all stop his 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 fighting career to do this. But let's say his fighting career does go down. This is the era of YouTube personalities and influencers. So his name probably is not going to go completely away. It'll probably still have some relevancy. He'll probably have a YouTube show and he'll probably make money. So if even if his boxing career does go down the hill, I think this it's something to still dig your teeth into while he's promoting he's being a because in the end it makes him look good it makes him it, it can help him get clients it can help him at the very least it, it help his promotion because he's try, out for the fighter so if it fails there's a purpose to it so i think he's he's definitely for it i don't know if he i think and i think he's also smart enough to know he can't pay for it himself so he's trying to find people that can pay for this thing because that's what it is you need the investment so it's a, I definitely agree with you. It's it's a, it's a lot of things, and 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 Alley Act really is the way to go. But it's it's just a for, unfortunate thing. We've covered this sport for so long. What the fighters make compared to other sports, and I know they're different sports, but even compared to say soccer and MLS, it's just it's stunning the the low amount of what the fighters make. But moving on, last point. Let's just try to wrap this up real quick and get out of here. Also, I mean it. it, it UFC this weekend, not a great card again. What a shocker. The main event is is true, just true trash. Um, one-sidedness, it's strange that's the main event at all. But I don't want to talk about the main event. Again, like we mentioned last week, you want coverage, fight-by-fight, fight, predictions, all this stuff. There's a lot of other podcasts. We go, we're, not, we're not about that predictions, wasting time on every fight and stuff like that. Anyway, but I want to talk about Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee is back. Um, he had an interesting point after his one fight venture outside the ufc after getting cut he had an interesting comment during the media day this week where he said uh he was talking about just uh his, his fight game and also mentioning fighting at the ufc apex and he said i feel like it's been about three years since i really performed at the height the right level and really had the right fight so for three years it's been me rebuilding myself rebuilding my strength everything to get back to that level I'm not going to lie. I wish I it w- this fight was in front of more fans. I don't know how many people are going to be at the Apex, but it's kind of stupid. I don't know what we're doing. You know what I mean? The pandemic is over. Um, two, two things. One, him still building to this next level, and he's not even 30 yet. This guy's 19 and 7, 3 and 4 since eight, 2018. The fact that he's still building to some level of a 26-year-old, my man, that's not going to happen. As a dude that's going and closing and about to be 40 this year, you're not going to be able to get back that youth. <laughs> so unless it's here, it ain't coming. And and that's always been Kevin Lee's problem. It hasn't been here. And the fact that he's getting another chance in the UFC after going to a decision with Diego Sanchez. They should just call – don't disrespect Diego. I know a lot of people call you a legend. You're a great fighter in your time. He should be called the washcloth because he's washed. And the fact that he couldn't – Finish Diego Sanchez at 29 years old. Diego is so, so badly CTE'd himself, unfortunately. It's stunning. Anthony, please tell me, please tell me you have the reasoning why Kevin Lee is getting another chance in the UFC. They cut him. Somehow, decisioning Diego Sanchez and Eagle FC was worth bringing a resign. Why do they think there's so much money in this guy? Please tell me, Anthony. I believe he's back in the UFC, one, because he deserves it, and two, because they are running a lot of cards and they need people who have some name value that they can place on on a card. Um, I mean, yes, he went to decision with Diego Sanchez at that Eagle FC event, but he blew out his knee in the first round. Like, he blew out his, he completely blew out his knee in the first round. That's why he hasn't been fighting since. He was literally rebuilding the, the, the strength in his leg. Like, this guy beat Diego Sanchez with one leg. I, you know, I think that's something to take into consideration, too. Also, I, I think we and I've said this before on, on other platforms, man. Kevin Lee is is one of those those huge what ifs in the sport. He's a guy who has had all the potential in the world, but yeah. several circumstances have prevented him from capitalizing on said potential. Um, the the rise that he was on from from a, a performance standpoint up until when his coach uh, tragically passed away. Like that totally stifled his growth. That totally stifled his development. That was something that he, that I don't think he ever really recovered from when he fought, uh, Gregory Gillespie and that, and you know, that, uh, three year time period that he's talking about where he last felt like he was fighting at his best. 
the Gregor Gillespie fight um, at Madison Square Garden. I believe you were there for that one, right? Yeah. Uh, with the yeah, um, I believe he was working with Faraz Sahabi for that fight, mm-hmm. and that was yeah. and and you saw the the fruits of that labor. He has had this difficult time trying to find the right coaching to mesh with what he built already. And that seemed to be a glimpse of it. And then after that, he gets paired up with Charles Oliveira, who we know would happen to him after he beat Kevin Lee, which, by the way, was a, was the first fight of the pandemic. Like he's fighting in an empty arena in Brazil when the the world is literally shutting down around them. These aren't normal circumstances. Then he goes back up to welterweight to fight Daniel Rodriguez, who is a tough fighter. And Kevin Lee has always been undersized for welterweight. You know, this is, this is someone who, who is, who's faced a lot of unfortunate circumstances, you know, in, in his career. And I think why not bring him back to the UFC? Why not? Like this, the UFC certainly needs the name value for this, this assembly line of just rank and file cards that we get every week. Mm. I'm happy to see a name like Kevin Lee on it because at least I know this is a UFC caliber fighter. <laughs> um, and even if, even if he comes out looking like a diminished version of himself, then so be it. Then maybe his time did pass, but like you said, he's not 30 yet. Um, you can hit like, yes, his, his body isn't going to be the most athletic and great um, at 33 or something as it is at, at 25. Like we know that, but um, fighters tend to peak in their early thirties. That's when, that's when it all clicks. That's when they, they have the physicality, but their minds are sharper. They make better decisions. The fight IQ is there. They've, they've been around different scenarios. So they have the experience to draw on, to know how to handle uh, particular situations. Why not? Let's see what happens. A lot of excuses, Anthony. A lot of excuses for this man. <laughs> Do you know him? Is this your cousin or something, Anthony? I mean, we could say that. For next he, time. We probably could blend in at my family reunion. <laughs> he probably can. <laughs> but that is our show for this week. Of course, like I mentioned before, if you dig the show, you like what we're talking about, you like the conversation, the debate, like the episode, share it, subscribe to our channel, comment, let us know. Let us know what some of the conversations you like us to hear to talk about. Let us know future guests we should have on the show. But I am Jason Burgos. He is Anthony Walker. Until next time, everybody. Bye bye.